chapter six of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva mrs chain over the coffee curiously enough there seemed to be a disposition to refrain from market quotations for general bent skilfully directed the conversation into other channels motoring aviation the horse show the newest pictures in the metropolitan and jeff listened avidly newly alive to the interests of these people who as mrs rumson had said above twenty-third street took on a personality which was not to be confounded with the life downtown where he had first met them when curtis janey asked him if he rode jeff only laughed oh yes of course you do one doesn't punch cattle for nothing but jumping is different and then there's the saddle oh i think i can stay on without going for the leather anyway i'd like to try right o said janey heartily we've had one run already a drag couldn't you and mrs ray come out soon we're having a few people for the hunt week after next there will be cortland bent jack perrault the rumsons the billy havilands mrs cheyne the baroness and if you'll come along yourselves delighted i'm sure camilla will be glad to accept we haven't many engagements i think you've hidden your wife long enough mr ray does she ride too like a breeze astride but she wouldn't know what to do on a side saddle i don't blame her some of our women ride across gladys gretchen mrs cheyne well jeff silently raised his brandy glass in imitation of his companion i'm glad there are a few horses somewhere around here i haven't seen any outside of the shafts of a hansom since i left the west the horse would soon be extinct if it wasn't for curtis janey put in the general breezily why he won't even own a motor no snorting devils for him might give his horses the pip or something the stable is worth seeing though you're going aren't you ray in the library later ray found mrs cheyne until he had come to new york ray's idea of a woman had never strayed from camilla there were other females in the valley and he had known some of them but camilla had made any comparison unfortunate she was a being living in a sphere apart with which mere clay had nothing in common he had always thought of her as he thought of the rare plants in jim noakes conservatory in denver flowers to be carefully nurtured and admired even marriage had made little difference in his point of view it is curious that he thought of these things when he leaned over mrs cheyne to his casual eye this new acquaintance possessed many of the characteristics of his wife perhaps even more than camilla she represented a mental life of which he knew nothing contributed more than her share to the sublimated atmosphere in which he found himself moving they might have been grown in the same conservatory but if camilla was the orchid mrs cheyne was the poinsettia flower and yet she was not beautiful as camilla was her features taken one at a time were singularly imperfect he was almost ready to admit that she wasn't even strikingly pretty but as he looked at her he realized for the first time in his life the curious fact that a woman need not be beautiful to be attractive he saw that she was colorful and unusually shapely and that she gave forth a flow of magnetism which her air of ennui made every effort to deny her eyes like her hair were brown but the pupils when she lifted her lids high enough to show them were so large that they seemed much darker her dinner dress cut straight across her shoulders was of black like the jewelled bandeau in her hair 
and the pearls which depended from her ears these ornaments together with the peculiar dressing of her hair gave her well-formed head an effect which if done in brighter hues might have been barbaric but which in the subdued tones of her color scheme only added to the impression of sombre distinction as he approached she looked up at him sleepily i thought you were never coming she said did you said ray bewildered i i came as soon as i could mrs cheyne we had our cigars oh i know men have always been selfish they always will be selfish cousin cornelius is provincial to herd the men and women like sheep the ones in one pen the others in another there isn't a salon in europe a real salon where the women may not smoke if they like you want to smoke i'm famished but the general doesn't approve ray had taken out his cigarette case couldn't we find a spot she rose and led the way through a short corridor to the conservatory where they found a stone bench under a palm he offered her his case and she lit the cigarette daintily holding it by the very tips of her fingers and steadying her hand against his own as ray would have done with a man's ray did not speak he watched her amusedly aware of the extraordinary interest with which she invested his pet vice thanks she said gratefully turning toward him then she lowered her chin opened her eyes and looked straight into his you know you didn't come to me nearly as soon as i thought you would i i didn't know you should have known why should i because i wanted you to i'm glad you wanted me i think i'd have come anyway she smiled approvingly then my efforts were unnecessary your efforts yes i willed it you interested me you see he looked at her quickly her eyes only closed sleepily then opened again i'm lucky he said that's sure how do you know i may not be at all the kind of person you think i am i'll take a chance on that but i wish you'd tell me what made you want me i was bored i usually am the bent parties are so formal and tiresome everybody always says the same things does the same things she sighed deeply if cousin cornelius saw me now i'd be in disgrace i wonder why i always like to do the things people don't expect me to you wouldn't be much of a woman if you didn't he laughed but i like surprises there wouldn't be much in life if you knew what was going to happen every minute you didn't think i was going to happen then uh, no maybe i hope so well she smiled i have happened what are you going to do about it be thankful mostly you seem sort of human somehow you do what you want to say what you want and if i don't get what i want ask for it she laughed i told gladys it was very inconsiderate of her not to send you in to dinner with me she's always doing that sort of thing gladys lacks a sense of proportion as it is the evening is almost gone and we've only begun i feel as if i'd known you for years said jeff heartily that's funny too he added because you're so different from any other woman i've ever known you look as if you might have come from a book but you speak out like mesa city tell me about mesa city you know i was out west last year were you sure eagerly in colorado oh yes she said slowly but i was living in nevada nevada that was my old stamping ground i punched for the bar circle down there what part reno oh i went there for my divorce his voice fell a note i didn't know that i'm uh, awfully sorry you were so unfortunate won't you tell me about it there's nothing to tell Chain and i were 
incompatible at least that's what the lawyers said as such things go i thought we got along beautifully we weren't in the least incompatible so long as chain went his way and let me go mine it's so easy for married people to manage if they only knew how but chain didn't he didn't want to be with me himself and he didn't want anyone else to be so things came to a pretty pass it actually got so bad that when people wanted either of us to dinner they had to write first to inquire which of us was to stay away it made a lot of trouble and the chain family got to be a bore so we decided to break it up was he unkind to you cruel oh dear no i wish he had been our life was one dreadful round of cheerful monotony i got so tired of the shape of his ears that i could have screamed yes i really think she mused that it was his ears ray examined her with his baby-like stare as though she had been a specimen of ore there seemed to be no doubt of the fact that she was quite serious i'm really sorry for him it is very sad she threw back her head and laughed softly my dear mr ray your sympathy is touching he would appreciate it as much as i do if he had not already married again married here in new york oh yes they're living within a stone's throw of my house do you see him of course i dined with them only last week you see and she leaned toward him with an air of new confidences that's only human i can't really give up anything i've once possessed you know i try not to sell horses that i've liked i did sell one once and he turned up one morning in a hired brougham that taught me a lesson i've never forgotten now when they outlive their usefulness i turn them out on my farm in westchester of course i couldn't do that to harold but i did the next best thing i've satisfied myself that he's properly looked after and i'm sure he'll reflect credit on his early training and he's happy blissfully so it wouldn't be possible for a man to have the advantages of a training like the one i have given him and not be able to make a woman happy but he didn't make you happy me oh i wasn't made for bondage of any kind most women marry because they're bored or because they're curious in either case they pay a penalty marriage provides no panacea one only becomes more bored with one's own husband or more curious about other people's husbands are you curious you don't look as if you cared enough to be curious i do care she held her cigarette at arm's length and flicked off its ash with her little finger mr ray i'll let you into a secret a woman never appears so bored as when she is intensely interested in something never so much interested as when she is bored to extinction i am curious i am trying to learn without asking you impertinent questions how on earth you and mrs ray ever happened to marry she tilted her chin impudently and looked down her nose at him her eyes masked by her dark lashes through which it hardly seemed possible that she could see him at all jeff laughed she had her nerve with her he thought but her frankness was amusing he liked the way she went after what she wanted oh camilla i don't know it just happened i guess she's more your kind than mine i'm a good deal of a scrub mrs cheyne you see i never went to college or even to high school camilla knows a lot she used to teach but i reckon she's about given up the idea of trying to teach me i'm a lowbrow all right i never read a novel in my life you haven't missed much books were only meant for people who are willing to take life at second hand one year of the life you lived on the range 
is worth a whole shelfful the only way to see life is through one's own eyes oh i've seen life i've been a cowboy rancher speculator miner and other things and i've seen some rough times but i wouldn't have worked at those things if i hadn't needed the money now i've got it maybe i'll learn something of the romantic side of life she leaned back and laughed at him you dear delicious man then it has never occurred to you that during all these years you've been living a romance he looked at her askance and then to cap it all she finished you discover a gold mine and marry the prettiest woman in the west i suppose you'll call that prosaic too you're really quite remarkable what is it that you expect of life after all i don't know he said slowly something more but there's nothing left oh yes there is i've only tasted success but it's good and i like it what i've got makes me want more there's only one thing in the world that really means anything to me and that's power but your money yes money but money itself doesn't mean anything to me idle money the kind of money you people in new york are content to live on the interest on lands or bonds it's what live active money can do that counts with me my money has got to keep working the way i work only harder some people worship money for what it can buy their bodies i don't i can't eat more than three square meals a day i want my money to make the desert bloom to make the earth pay up what it owes and build railroads that will carry its products where they're needed i want it to take the miserable people away from the alleys in your city slums and put them to work in god's country where their efforts will count for something in building up the waste ground that's waiting for them out there why mrs cheyne last year i took up a piece of desert there wasn't a thing on it but rabbit brush last spring i worked out a colonization plan and put it through there's a town there now called rayville with five thousand inhabitants two hotels three miles of paved sidewalk a public school four factories and two newspapers all that in six months it's a hummer i can tell you as he paused for breath she sighed and yet you speak of romance romance there's no romance in that that's just get up and get i had to hustle mrs cheyne i'd promised those people the water from the mountains on a certain date but i couldn't do it and the big ditch wasn't finished i was in a bad fix for i'd broken my word those people had paid me their money and they threatened to lynch me they had a mass meeting and were calling me some ugly names when i walked in why they didn't take a shot at me then i don't know but they didn't i got up on the table and uh, when they stopped yelling i began to talk to em i didn't know just what to say but i knew i had to say something and make good or go out of town in a pine box i began by telling em what a great town rayville was going to be they only yelled where's our water i told them it was coming they tried to hoot me down but i kept on weren't you afraid you bet i was but they never knew it i tried to think of a reason why they didn't have that water and in a moment they began to listen i told them there was thirty thousand dollars worth of digging to be done i told them it would be done too but that i didn't see why that money should go out of rayville to a lot of contractors in denver i'd been saving that work for the citizens of rayville i was prepared to pay the highest wages for good men and if rayville said the word they could begin the big ditch to-morrow what did they do they stopped yelling right there and i knew i had em going in a minute they started to cheer before i finished they were carrying me around the hall on their shoulders phew but that took some quick thinking 
mrs cheyne had started forward when he began and as he went on her eyes lost their sleepy look her manner its languor and she followed him to the end in wonder when he stopped she sank back in her corner smiling and repeated romance what romance is there left in the world for a man like you he looked up at her with his baby stare and then laughed awkwardly you're making fun of me mrs cheyne i've been talking too much i reckon she didn't reply at once and the look in her eyes embarrassed him he reached for his cigarette case offered it to her and when she refused took one himself lit it slowly gazing out of the transom opposite i hope i haven't tired you mrs cheyne it's dangerous to get me talking about myself i never know when to stop i don't want you to stop i've never been so entertained in my life i don't believe you know how interesting you are he turned toward her embarrassed and still incredulous you're very kind he muttered you mustn't be so humble she broke in sharply you weren't so a minute ago i like you best when you are talking of yourself i thought i'd like to talk about you she waved a hand in deprecation me oh no we can't come to earth like that tell me another fairy tale fairy tale then you don't believe me oh yes she laughed i believe you but to me they're fairy tales just the same it seems so easy for you to do wonderful things i wish you'd do some conjuring for me oh there isn't any magic business about me but i'll try what do you want most she put an elbow on her knee and gazed at the blossom in her fingers her voice too fell a note what i think i want most she said slowly is a way out of this she waved the blossom vaguely in the direction of the drawing-room i'm sick of it all of the same tiresome people the same tiresome dinners dances teas we're so narrow so cynical so deeply enmeshed in our small pursuits i'm weary desperately weary of myself you yes and then with a short unmirthful laugh that's my secret you didn't suspect it did you lord no and after a pause you're unhappy about him chain oh no he's the only thing i am happy about have you ever been really bored mr ray never i never even heard the word until i came to new york have you ever been so tired that your body was numb so that if you struck it a blow you were hardly conscious of it when you felt as if you could go to sleep and never want to wake up well that's the condition of my mind it's so tired of the same impressions that it fails to make note of them the people i see the things i do are all blurred and colorless like a photograph that has been taken out of focus the only regret i have when i go to sleep is that i have to wake up again my dear mrs cheyne oh i'm not morbid i'm too bored to be morbid even i don't think i'm even unhappy it takes an effort to be unhappy i can't tell you what the matter is one drifts i've been drifting a long time i think i have too much money i want to want something don't you ever want anything you can't have she sat upright and her voice instead of drawling languidly came in the quick accents of discovery yes i do i've just found out you've actually created a new interest in life won't you be nice to me come and see me often and tell me more fairy tales end of chapter six